Thank you, and, and, and good evening. Um, uh, it's really um, delightful to get a chance to meet people who I've admired in, from their writing for, for years. And what I want to talk about is sort of the big picture of the context of how we got into this situation with respect to electromagnetic fields and microwave radiation. Uh, we have a tradition in the United States of um, looking at the new technology as though it has to be safe until it's proven to be guilty. And our assumption, the default assumption with which we greet anything new is it's got to be a good idea. Otherwise, why would we be doing it? And that policy has clearly shown us uh, that it's not been correct. For example, if you look at things like asbestos, asbestos was used by Charlemagne uh, with a tablecloth that was made of asbestos, and he would throw it into the fire to clean the crumbs because it would not burn and he could get rid of all of the garbage on the tablecloth. Uh, years later, uh, when people started living a little bit longer, it was noted that those who worked to mine asbestos, which could be knit into a cloth, um, tended not to live very long. And by the 17th, 18th century, Ramazzini had uh, figured out that people who did mining of minerals, whether asbestos or iron or, in fact, the early version of coal or lignite, tended to have lung disease, and it was noted that these were problems. But still the technologies, whether it was asbestos cloth or fiber or coal mining or the production of iron, the technology were assumed to, to be safe uh, until proven to be guilty. And I think we have to, as a society, rethink our approach to technologies in general. And I think we have the right to ask for some evidence of safety as well as efficacy before we start with something new. And I think of things like Google Glass. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever seen Google Glass. Google Glass, has anyone seen it? Anyone tried to use it? Right. Um, it's quite ingenious, but it involves taking a microwave radiating device, keeping it right near the temporal lobe, having it constantly sending a signal back and forth to the front of the glass where it projects an image to a third device. And so it's constantly radiating that microwave radiation that you heard me talk about earlier today. And when I asked, which I did, one of the senior people in the Google program, what were you thinking when you put a microwave radiating device right smack next to the brain and in front of the eye that has no cooling mechanism? They said, what were we thinking? We weren't. Honest. Honest. I said, okay, well, now I'd like you to think about it. Well, obviously, at this year's Consumer Electronics Show, the hottest new item being touted by everybody is wearable electronics. And not only wearable, but implantable. You can monitor your blood pressure, your pulse, and your, other, and your lung function by swallowing a chip or wearing or implanting a computer into your body. People are already using this to keep track of their companion animals. Some people have apparently done it for children or people with Alzheimer's who might be wandering. There are trade-offs in life, but I think we need to rethink our approach to technology, whether it's nanotechnology or GMOs or some of the toxic chemicals that we're dealing with, rather than assuming that if we can do it technologically, if we can put the gene of a tomato into a fish, it's a good idea. I'm not so, I think that that assumption is what we have to challenge. I, I really think we do. And in my work in the history of uh, cancer research and the secret history of the war on cancer, I repeatedly document how that assumption proved false. Let me give you one example. During World War II and prior to the run-up to World War II, British chemists synthesized something called diethyl stobestrol. It was made by the British government. They didn't patent it. So the Germans immediately began to produce it, of course. That was what went on economically during that time prior to the war. It was discovered upon its invention. It was identified as a possible cancer-causing agent, diethyl stobestrol, a hormone. The Germans manufactured it and used it to fatten their cows and pigs. It wasn't until it was proven to cause cancer in women 40 years later that we stopped using it as such. That kind of thinking, I think, has to stop.
Pass the microphone. Sure. And now I know I have a. a Do we ask questions now? Yeah. Oh, are we asking yes, questions or questions talking now? now? We're going to ask questions. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, do you have a question? Sure. Go ahead. Um, I have a question, Deborah. What was the most shocking moment, or one of them, that you had discovered in your research about the thinking that poisons us? That's a good question. I discovered the um, self-published biography of a guy named Robert Crane, C-R-A-N-E, who had been an electrical engineer for Motorola and who'd served as a guinea pig testing the early, early phones. Remember, the phones were first invented, actually, in the 70s, and the only thing preventing them from proliferating was that we had rules at localities preventing towers from going everywhere. And they knocked that out in 1996 by passing a National Telecommunications Act that specifically forbids you from raising a health issue about the concerned location of any tower. It's against the federal law. That was passed under my president, Bill Clinton. I had no idea what was going on. We now know that once you pass that law, it made it possible to put towers anywhere, including a few feet outside your bedroom, which happens in some cities. And what Robert Crane wrote in his biography was a sickening uh, account of the callous thinking of the industry. He himself developed two brain tumors. He wrote the book in between recovering from one or the other. And I interviewed people who knew him and people who were told to stay away from him when they worked for industry, who he felt ashamed because this industry did such a good job. Whenever someone would report an issue, as he did, here he was exposed. He, would, he had to hold these things. He would get headaches and heated up his, he would get heat effects because he was using that much. And yet when he complained of this, they just blew him off. And, uh, and he died, obviously, of, the, of these brain cancers. And that, that was pretty horrifying. You know, I think one other example was this fellow, quite a character I write about in a chapter called The Doctor Who Danced with the Devil. He worked for the tobacco industry for years until 1992. He was the director of tobacco industry research for Germany. Had lots of money. And in 1992, he published his research showing that tobacco caused cancer. I know that may shock you. But he actually believed, as a German scientist, that uh, he wasn't sure until that moment. Well, in 1992, he's one of the most powerful people in German science. The tobacco industry was much more respected in Germany than it was the United States. Although, remember, in the United States, they did pretty well for a long time with Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. They did. And when he left that job, they gave him something to do, to kind of keep him busy. And they gave him a project to work on cell phones with $5 million grant from the European Union. And he, like I at the time, was convinced there could be no problem. So when they started to get positive results showing that cell phones could damage the brain, they went out and bought a couple million dollars in new equipment because he was convinced it was a measurement error. Right? It couldn't be possible that cell phones could damage brain cells. After all, they got new equipment, spent a couple million dollars more, but the result couldn't go away. And then when he tried to publish it, they went after him just like he had seen others go after, you know. And this guy, fortunately, was rather wealthy and powerful, and he went after them. And just recently, he filed a lawsuit against them, and they tried to get him accused of fraud, which you know is a pretty serious thing for a scientist. They tried to get his articles withdrawn from publication, and when that failed, they hired a public relations group to, quote, war game the science. And I have that memo in my book, war game the science. And when all of that failed, he, he ultimately prevailed. But even today, Science Magazine has never issued a retraction of their story accusing him of fraud. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I guess one of the questions I would love to know is, is there anything we can, what can be done now that this technology is completely pervasive and the utility of it is everybody has been convinced we need to ha have this technology, is there anything that now can be done either to make it safe or change the landscape of how it's being used and how we're exposed to this? Yes. 
And I'm looking forward to working with you all on this. And we have a limited number of these cards here that tell you how to practice safe tech. And they say, do it with <laughs> wires or do it wired. Practice safe tech. Use and carry wireless gear away from your head and body. Beware of weak network signals, because when the signal's weak, the device has to work harder, whether it's a laptop or an iPad or your phone. Before bedtime, turn off your wireless devices and networks. Most of them constantly emit radiation. Get in the habit of powering off more often, because each device radiates anybody around you. The worst time to have your phone on is when you're in a car driving and holding it next to your head, or if you're in an elevator or a train that is not wired for an antenna, then the radiation pings all over the place. You're like in a microwave oven. Uh, generally go corded versus wireless. That means landlines are important for three reasons. They're safer, they're more secure, and they're better for your long-term health. And in storms, like we've just had, these wireless devices don't work. How many of you lost power, couldn't get your cell phone to work during the cold? Right? It's, they're not meant for the cold. And the truth is, if we are about to commit to a national policy that is insane to get rid of all corded landlines. You better let the president and the FCC know loud and clear that's a lousy idea. It's going to make American business vulnerable. It's going to mean that we will be able to sabotage the system very easily. Finally, say no to tech while moving. That means driving, walking, biking, blading, or skiing. And uh, where I am in Wyoming, people will be taking a cell phone and putting it inside their helmet when they're skiing or biking. Uh, or It's a terrible, t terrible idea. Distraction while you're moving can be the difference between life and death. Really, seconds, particularly when you're moving at high speeds or, you know, frankly, even on a bicycle. So these cards, you see these cards? They're really cute. They were designed by some artists in Wyoming, and they say, do it with wires, practice safe tech. <laughs> it's cute. It is, it is cute. Yeah. They will be available on our website and hopefully working with you as well. But to, it costs us close to a dollar a card. Now, we need companies to step forward that want to produce these cards. You can put your logo on it. Or people who fund us uh, to give them away. We have another project. We're going to develop cards like this to hand to young, harried parents who don't understand that a cell phone is on a pacifier. And we also have advice just on the phones alone. So we're working to come up with this sort of simple, practical things you can do, because we're not going to say no to these things any more than we'd say no to cars but we have to make them as safe as possible. And I do believe that people who are sensitive to wireless radiation have a right to be able to exist in public without feeling that their health is endangered. And that means we're going to have to create wireless-free zones. Good.